hear me, but I'm, my name is Christopher Snyder. I'm a researcher at the University of Rochester. I also volunteer here at the school. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, microremediation. Um, so I actually did my master's degree in um, the study of mushrooms. I studied a specific species of mushroom called Aerocyte indicator that infects blind grapes. Um, so we were working on the best ways to, you know, control those uh, those fungi in order to prevent them from infecting our wine and making our wine taste bad. So, um, but along the way, I learned a lot about um, mushrooms in general and all the ways in which they can be friends instead of foes. And uh, really, the thing I want you to think about during this presentation is not how people can use mushrooms um, for you know, improving our communities and ecosystems, but how mushrooms can better use people um, for improving their communities and ecosystems. Um, because uh, the interesting thing is that it's like, mycology has often, you know, in a lot of the presentations I've seen been presented as the neglected megascience. And what I mean by that is that there is an inverse relationship between how much mushrooms and fungi have to offer us and how much we know about them. There's very, very little. We only know about 5% of the species. Hello. Microremediation is fantastic. And uh, so, like I was saying, there's an inverse relationship between you know, how much we know about mushrooms and how much they have to offer us. So, like, I wanted to kind of use this opportunity to kind of bridge that gap a little bit and you know, just kind of change the way we think about fungi. Um, so, just to kind of set the tone. So, it's 1988, this is the Meteor Space Station. Um, the USSR is in control. They have a series of cosmonaut cosmonauts right, like, rotating in and out of the space station. And one day, um, they actually look out the window and they notice the window is fogging over. Um, kind of like, you know, that is immediately alarming because they're supposed to be pretty well out there. And they notice this window is fogging over from the outside. And they, upon closer inspection, they actually find that there's something growing in green gloss growing along the outside of the space station. And then they go inside, they notice it kind of smells like rotten apples on the inside of the space station. They notice it more and more. And when they actually leave and come back, it comes so strong, it smells like you're in a basement, like stacked on all sides with rotten apples. And they go in, and they look, and they find, they look in the wires, and the wires are saturated in this green and mildew. And they go around, and like so many of these, and their panels are being eaten into. And what is it? It's actually a fungi. Now, when that first broke out, when that first news first broke, it caused a flurry of speculation. Remember, this is the days of Star Trek. <laughs> you know, this is the flurry of speculation about what this possibly was. And there was a solid, there still is, I think, a thriving community of people that believe this was actually a fungi from space. But, you know, DNA analysis proved that this was actually a earthly origin. But my question is, can you actually blame them? I mean, look at fungi. <laughs> <laughs> they just... They, they don't seem to just fit in, you know what I mean? They, they, they look somewhat biotic, but they seem so alien at the same time. They don't seem to like, you know, fit into our typical conception of what a living thing should be. It's just so out there. It's like they don't conform to our normal expectations of anything that you would want, you know, a living thing to do. Um, it feeds on dead things. It arises in the dark. It thrives in the west, wet and moist areas that we never want to go as people. Um, but at the same time, um, they're actually more similar to us than plants. Um, originally, when the actual you know, trees of tree of life was splitting off in the first few like few million years, um, it was actually the branch that split off um, that became you know us also included fungi. The branch that went on to form plants actually split off earlier. So we're actually closer to fungi than we are to plants. And actually, you know, we behave more like fungi than we think. Fungi breathe in oxygen. They breathe out carbon dioxide, just like we do. They um, undergo respiration. They feed on things much in the same way we do. Um, we actually share a lot of the same um, homologs, the same, same basic genetic toolkit. Uh, a greater portion of that is shared between us and fungi than us and plants. Um, you know, I mean, they've, they've been with us for a very, very, very long time. Um, there's actually a theory stating that when um, humans were first, you know, trying to like experiment with our environment, one of the 
first things we did was stumble upon mustard that looked very much like this one. <laughs> Uh, very much, very much like this one, and using it, um, they actually were able to, like you know, engage in some psychological exploration of their own um, that I do not do not explicitly condone. <laughs> and uh, but then we have something like this, and it just doesn't seem to fit in. Um, but what I really like to see is that uh, we kind of grown up like lived side by side with mushrooms for so long, and I want to see if we can expand our idea of what they can be used for. Um, and one of those uses is microremediation. So what it is, is the idea that a mushroom is an integral part and like the decomposer portion of the mushroom um, like you know, kingdom is uniquely capable as a portion of the nature's cleanup group. They take in you know, all the matter that is dead, all the matter that is not in use in any other part of the ecosystem anymore they actually bring it back into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the accidents of this are that they are exceptionally capable of breaking down complex polymers. Uh, it's actually because uh, mushrooms are, and fungi in general, are one of the only like organisms capable of actually breaking down a substance called lignin, which is the part of wood that holds it together. It makes it very firm and resilient. Um, so I don't know if you've ever had to deal with white rot and trees um, or heard of white rot, or black rot, or brown rot, or anything like that. Um, so what that is is that's actually a fungus that gets into, you know, the heartwood of the tree and actually starts breaking down that lignin. And you know, what it's capable of doing is, you know, it takes that you know, hard, meaty, like heartwood, breaks it down, and kind of like a white crumble. You know what I mean? Because that's what the wood is minus the lignin. All right, and then that can be feasted on by other organisms, and then, yeah, so all that wood would then make its way back into the ecosystem. But without fungi, we actually would not have a way for wood to like um, make its way back in. Wood would just kind of exist as stale matter. It would be able to actually like you know work its way back into the ecosystem. So fungi, you know, through that very important role, allow the ecosystem to keep recycling, you know, keep recycling nutrients. Um, but there's a little biological accident. Because it's so good at breaking down that complex polymer, um, it's actually really good at breaking down other complex, pol complex polymers. Uh, it's really good at breaking down things that you know, we wouldn't actually expect it to be able to do. Um, so things like plastic, like we'll see, things like oil, uh, and actually have a list of 10 um, different ways in which we can actually go through. Um, we can break down food waste, we can break down um, and there's a difference between breaking down and concentrating what I'll get into, where we can actually concentrate radioactive waste and go through it and do things like that. And it's all thanks to the fact that um, fungi is capable of breaking down those complex polymers. Um, so just getting a little bit of the diversity of fungi right now. Um, so there's actually two different branches, two different ways in which fungi interact with their environment. They're either necrotrophic or biotrophic. Um, the ones we're going to be focusing on today are the necrotrophic fungi, but I also make you know, it known that there are biotrophic fungi. Those are the ones like athlete's foot. Those are the ones, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, which are like the uh, you know the fungi, like erysite indicator, which is the white powder mildew that will affect the race. Those are the actual fungi that actually go after other living organisms and attempt to break them down while they're still alive. Um, but the necrotrophics are those ones that are like, you know, that's the typical fungi you go out and find like growing in the forest in the fall. And they're feeding on that dead matter at the bottom of the forest. And just to give you a basic idea of how this all comes together. So if you look at a fungi, you generally recognize it as a mushroom. There's other kind of, but like the most iconic idea of fungi is this mushroom that gives like, this fruiting body actually grows up out of the ground and spreads spores. And those spores are you know, just like the pollen or just like you know, seeds in the sense that they will actually spread out you know, and spawn new, um, they'll go out and they'll actually spawn new mushrooms and new fungi um, somewhere else. Um, but the interesting thing is that they actually, well, mushrooms have gender, or not quite like the yeah, animal idea of gender, but they have mating types. And what will happen is that you'll have spores of different mating types um, what will happen is that they'll all start producing um, which are called what are called hyphae. 
and they'll actually start, you know, they'll land and they'll start sprouting the little hyphae and they'll grow together, and actually need two different mating types coming together in order to form an actual um, full grown uh, mushroom that can produce its own, you know, fruity bodies. You know what I mean? And it's really interesting to see what happens when um, two mating types come together. So the hyphae hy hy will come together and they'll essentially blend. But if they're of the same mating type, then they'll go like this. They'll actually form like a barrier in between them. So it's actually really cool to see how that comes together. And uh, so this is what you normally see when you think of mushrooms. It's like you know, these nice caps you see growing out in the woods. But if you really want to think about what a fungus is, what's more like that? This is the hyphae growing out of these networks called mycelium. All right. And these are the actual heavy hitters of the fungus. This is essentially like a digestive system and a root system and actually a nervous system all rolled up into one. You can actually think of a fungus more as like a network-based organism. And this is what it looks like under a scanning electron microscope. All right. Just like the most tightly woven network that we're aware of in biology. You know what I mean? It's just all of these growing over and crossing through each other. And actually the coolest thing is actually how they grow. Um, so part of what makes fungi such a powerful, um, you know, degrading agent is that they don't just slither through the substrate like roots do. They actually have a pressurized system. So they're actually ten times as pressure at the end of each one of those hyphae. It's pressurized ten times as much as the tires of your car. And the way they work is essentially it's like a hydraulic drill where at the, at the tip of each hyphae, it'll just kind of release a little bit of that pressure, which will push the tip of the hyphae forward. I mean, that's why um, we actually see fungi that can punch through concrete, fungi that can pump out through like asphalt and stuff like that, because they're not just, you know, just kind of passively breaking down. They're actually pushing their way through their substrates. And uh, just to give an idea, um, so we actually have uh, fungi that will grow, you know, and they'll actually grow on the edges of rocks. And they won't just be like on the rock passively, they'll actually be eating the rock. Um, so they'll actually be working their way through and, you know, using their hyphae to essentially punch into the rock and then secrete enzymes to break down the rock a little bit more. They actually eat in the same way that like a fly eats. Um, so I don't know if you've ever seen the way a fly eats, but um, when a fly wants to eat something, they don't have a mouth or mandibles to chew on. They essentially just have like, like a sponge on the end of a little long mandible. All right. And what happens is they just release enzymes onto whatever they want to eat that will break it down and they just suck it all up. So their stomach is actually on the outside of their body. And it's actually, you can think about like the tips of these hyphae are all like, like a bunch of those little tongues. All right. They excrete enzymes you know, that digest the environment immediately around them, and then they just kind of draw in that dissolved nutrients from surrounding them. And um, another more very important thing you want to remember about fungi is that they are incredibly resilient. Like we already talked about they can survive in the space, but another thing that they can do is they can actually, and this is what makes them really useful, is they can survive in highly radi radioactive environments. So, I'm going to try and see if I can get this name right the first time. So, we have Rotatoriola tinoinensis. And they actually went through and they tested out a bunch of different fungi. And what we actually found out is that we can use Rotatoriola because it's so resilient that we can actually inoculate it meters away from a toxic waste site or a radioactive waste site, and it'll form like a biological barrier. And what will happen is is that as that radioactive waste approaches and seeps out to the point where the um, where the fungus is, the fungus will actually draw in and make it into a light and draw in those heavy metals and make them into a little bit more benign substance. Yeah. And even if in the trough, you do not want to eat these mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, sorry, but they're yeast, so they're not going to become a mushroom, but at the same time, you do not want to eat this fungi. All right, you do not want to drink beer you're made from this yeast. Trust me. But at the same time, what they can do is they actually draw in and concentrate that material. All right? And that's actually what we see in the area surrounding um, Chernobyl. Is that around Chernobyl, um, they actually had these incredibly dark 
mushrooms that flourish in the area surrounding um, because the melanin actually works the same way in a mushroom as it works in us. Um, so it's like you notice darker skin tones as we get towards areas that have more and more sun exposure and um, like a hotter, hotter planet. It's because melanin actually serves as a means by which we protect ourselves from radiation. Um, so actually, mushrooms use it in the same way, but they can take them to a further extreme. So that means they can actually encroach upon and flourish in these radioactive environments. Um, not only because they can withstand it, but because mushrooms, except certain types of mushrooms, can actually use the melanin to convert radiation into the usable energy that they can use to grow. And again, you do not want to eat those mushrooms, <laughs> but they fulfill a very important purpose in the sense that they can take an area that has a lot of diffuse radioactive material and they can concentrate it all inside their beauty bodies. So you can imagine, so you can imagine, you know, say you had like a 200 pound or like a 200 ton, like, you know, like area of soil that was radioactive. You could then toil in, you could, you could till in your, like, you know, your mushroom substrate. It would start spreading its mycelium through the soil. It would draw it all together. And then the mushrooms would, like, you know, be sprouting along the top. All right? What you would essentially do is over time, you would continually draw in all that radioactive material and then harvest the mushrooms. So then you went from something that was 200 tons to maybe one ton of radioactive mushroom that you put in the back of the truck and take somewhere else. You know what I mean? And then you could even incinerate those mushrooms into making it like maybe a few pounds of radioactive, of radioactive like uh, soot, essentially. So you went from having you know a 200 ton pile of radioactive soil to maybe a few pounds of radioactive soot. So that's kind of the promise that comes forward with a lot of these ideas and like, a lot of this, and this is again, a very, mycology is a very, very young science. And it's something that you know really actually got started in the 1960s and 70s in the DIY community, um, who were like finding out ways in which they could grow their own um, psychologically exploration, exploratory mushrooms. Um, that's actually a large part of this community. Is and like, but actually a lot of the um, you know, the ways in which a lot of the methods were actually developed in the kind of like you know DIY, you like do it yourself or and um, the other thing too is uh, we don't actually can't just go after the uh, dead matter. Um, we can actually also kind of apply fungi in a way that we can actually go over some living problems. So there's a certain type of fungus, a class of fungus that we call cordyceps. A certain class of fungus that we call cordyceps, and they can actually go after and infect, um, and they actually get their spores drawn into an insect, and then the mycelium spreads throughout the inside of the insect while it's still alive. All right. And then it kills the insect, spreads its spores, which go on to infect more and more insects. And it's actually a natural form of insect control. Um, you know, these will actually, and sometimes the fungus will actually take over, it's called the zombie ant syndrome, where the ant, it will actually take over the ant's brain and, and cause the ant, give the ant an insatiable urge to climb to the top of a blade of grass to just wait there until the fruiting bodies inside its system actually like, sprout out and then start spreading spores. So the ant, so the fungus actually commandeers the ant to maximize the rate at which it can spread its spores. And you know that's just kind of a note. So we can actually think about using this and kind of spreading these spores in a way that you could naturally control insect populations without needing to resort to you know heavy chemicals or like the Dow chemical type approach you know, for controlling insects. So it's like the thing I love about biology is that we can actually take a lot of the you know mechanisms that exist in nature and just kind of point them in a new direction. Uh, has anyone heard of uh, CRISPR? So what CRISPR is, it's actually a, um, it forms a complex with this other protein. It's a protein that exists in bacteria called Cas9. And what they're able to do is actually say, okay, well this um, little protein that exists inside these bacteria, we can actually use it um, to conduct genetic engineering. So it's like, what essentially it does is like, 
um, CRISPR acting naturally inside the bacteria will recognize a viral, um, you know, a viral structure DNA and cut it off. What we realize is that if we just kind of take away the viral DNA and give it you know, any piece of DNA um, that we want to deal with, um, it will actually look, it'll recognize that particular piece of DNA and be like, okay, I'm gonna go find this and cut it up, except it's not viral DNA. Maybe it's a particular gene that we want to use inside a knockout experiment. You know what I mean? Maybe we want to knock out a particular gene and see what happens um, in that animal after, after that takes place. So it's like kind of just redirecting um, systems that already exist out within nature. And um, that's exactly what we're doing um, when we do microremediation. And uh, just one more thing when we talk about oil. So, oil spills are obviously a huge problem. And, you know, they occur, you know, with, like increasing frequency, especially as we move from, like, you know, tanker, tanker like, you know, transportation of oil to more, like, you know, pipeline derivations of oil. We have huge problems in terms of being able to, like, you know, clean up these environments. Uh, so, again, uh, Fungi can actually be trained to, especially oyster mushrooms. Oyster mushrooms grow these big, fat, like fruiting bodies that you can actually use, and um, like you can basically you know, inoculate soil with oyster mushrooms that has been infected, that has been um, contaminated with oil, and it will actually feed on the oil. And it'll convert that oil from a toxic substance into sugar, and then get fed back into the ecosystem. And um, actually, Paul Stamets, uh, uh, he's a big event. He actually did this experiment where they had you know, three patches of oil contaminated soil. And what they did is they tried to treat one with chemicals, one with bacteria, and another one with fungi. All right. Um, so after, over time, the, you know, the chemical dispersants kind of just made the soil into this goop. The fungi, uh, the bacteria just kind of like made it smell a little bit. Um, and like, you know, like the oil concentration went down and nothing really else happened. But with the fungi treatment, not only were they able to clean up the oil, but the, fun, the actual fruiting bodies created by the oil acted, acted as a substrate for more organisms to come in. So all of a sudden you had plants grow. And those plants, and then you know, those plants grew and attracted pollinators. And those pollinators came in and all of a sudden you actually ended up going from this pile of oily dirt, ended up being an entire garden all in one go, it became, as he described, an oasis of life. And, you know, one of the most powerful things about this is actually the idea that fungi can learn. Um, and so, I know, like, in biology, one of the things we study is the fact that, you know, an, an organism will always try to be parsimonious with the energy that it uses, and an organism only has a certain amount of energy that it can expend in a given amount of time. Um, and one, thing, one of the things that takes a lot of energy for the cell to do is to create enzymes. Um, so there's actually a lot of enzymes that you know, a fungi can create, um, but they don't. And one of the cool things about fungi is that if you put them, if you give them a new substrate, and they've actually demonstrated this um, using like cigarette butts and stuff like that, if you give them a completely new substrate that it has never seen before in nature, uh, at first, it'll just kind of grow around it. It won't know what to do with it. But if you give it time, um, fungi do a very, very interesting thing. So this is one organism, so it's not like it's adapting over multiple generations, it's adapting within the lifetime of one organism. Um, what it will do is it will actually have those hyphae, will just kind of start growing around it. And the hyphae will start experimenting. It'll be like, well, it'll produce a small amount of a particular enzyme. It'll be like, does this work? And then another high fat here will produce another small amount of enzyme. Like, does this work? And we'll just keep doing that until an enzyme starts working, or a particular combination of enzymes starts working. All right? And then fungi have this amazing property where they're, they don't just send chemical signals you know, through their body. Um, you know, in our body, our nuclei, each one of our cells is a nuclei, except for our blood cells. Um, but they all stay right there. They, the, nuclei does, the nuclei doesn't move anywhere. In a fungi, the nuclei can actually travel like a car through the mycelium. You can actually look at this on a microscope. You can actually see in two directions. So it's not like it's unidirectional. It's like in two directions, little traffic of nuclei traveling through these mycelium. So if we actually go back, we 
Look at this guy right here. So I don't have the video with me right now, but if you imagine like, you know, it's like there's just fun, there's just nuclei traveling up and down. And what happens is that once one high phase decides I've got it, its nuclei will start traveling through and kind of informing the rest of the organism how to break it down. All right, and then once that adaption process is complete, then it starts completely breaking down the new substrate. All right, so that's part of the power that comes with you know fungi in the sense that like they are able to harvest, harness the idea of adaption, um, but also the speed at which you can do it in a single organism lifetime, uh, which I think is just like that blows my mind. I don't know if anyone else's mind like that. Like after studying biology for like like. Well, more than five years, like that's still in my mind. And, um, you know, and like that actually kind of, like, interestingly, it kind of interacts with our ideas of intelligence. This is like, what, what do you think, you know, means to be intelligent? You know, does it mean to know a lot of things? Does it mean to, you know, think quickly? Like, you know, my more, I have a more biology based idea of what intelligence means, and that's the ability to change over one lifetime. You know what I mean? You can think of, you know, for most of life, you know, bacteria, they can't really change over the course of one lifetime. They can do like horizontal gene transfers, but they can't really, you know, you know, in order to get a lot of change, you gotta wait for that bacteria to produce more generations of variation. A fungi can actually learn how to do new things, new tricks over the course of a single lifetime. And I think that qualifies it for this more like rudimentary understanding of intelligence. And so I don't want to talk for too long. I've gone for about 30 minutes now. Um, so I wanted to open it up for questions. I have a few more things I want to talk about. Do we have any questions right now? Yes. So yeah, so again, that rolls into um, one of the things um, that it's actually capable of is breaking down these complex polymers. And actually they have over at the university um, came out with this really cool thing called the fungi mutarium. And essentially how it works is that, uh, you know, they discovered this particular type of fungi called Aspergillus tubingensis um, that actually breaks down, that is capable of breaking down the complex polymers and poly polyethylenes that form most common plastics. Um, and the cool thing about that is that since it's able to break down the plastic so completely, and assuming that there aren't any super harmful chemicals like cohabitating inside that plastic, um, the mushroom, the end product of that is actually edible. Okay. So, so this is like an artist's uh, representation of like you know how you could actually use this, and they've actually gotten this to work. They've actually created edible pods of like you know mushroom, plastic mushroom. Um, but essentially, how it works is that you just create these little agar pods that are just like moldable gelatin. You stick them inside the little pits there, and then you fill each one of those pods with plastic. Um, after they're filled with plastic, you put the lid on and you just drop some liquid mycelium, aspergillus tubigensis, or some other you know, kind of fungus that digests plastic that we found since then. And you go in, and you just kind of break in the ice, you just totally take over the plastic that's inside the pot, and you take that out, and as long as and as long as you can make sure that the plastic's been totally dissolved, what you have is an edible product. You know what I mean? And it's actually, um, you know, mushrooms like are really make it up there in terms of superfoods, um, not on their own because they're actually um, negative calories. They're like celery, where like they could, they cost more, um, like they cost more calories to digest than they do to actually. Um, like they actually give you, but at the same time they do provide a lot of nutrients and they can actually be classified as a superfood. Um, so yeah, they actually are the only um, non-meat material, food material, that produces the fifth flavor, which is mommy. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, so it's like that fifth flavor, like that smoky flavor, it's called a mommy. Um, fungi can create it, um, but you can't get that from anywhere else. Um, so yeah, so that's the basic process and um, you know, so like I don't think I need to tell you guys that the plastic disposal problem is huge. You know what I mean? Like, keep producing more and more of this plastic, and uh, like we have less and less of like a recourse for what to do with it. 
journey. We've kind of been filling up landfills, um, but now we're realizing that those landfills are producing methane, <laughs> which is a very potent, meat, potent greenhouse gas. Um, so that's not so keeping going down this landfill route is not necessarily sustainable. Um, so what this provides is a means by which we can actually break down um, break down the plastic into something that's useful. And, Does that uh, mean like in the future they would have a way to that fungi to those landfills? I haven't heard of, I wasn't able to find any research on explicitly, so the problem with the landfill is that they're not purified, they're literally everything's all mixed in together. And um, a lot of, you know, the inoculation process is, um, so you can kind of think of fungi as like biological fire. <laughs> and, that, and like the way that means is that it was like, you kind of got to start it out as like a kindling. If it's something that's really, really easy to eat, I mean, so like you usually start off with like sugar water. And then you talk about these DIY, like my colleagues, let's go from sugar water, then we'll move on to like straw, and then move on from straw to wood chips. And then they can move on, and then once you go from there, then you can move on to stuff that's like harder and harder and harder to break down. And then you can move up to like oil and stuff like that. So it's like finding the right way to um, treat the soil and treat the, uh, the material we're doing in a way that allows you to scale it, but isn't like massively energy intensive. Okay. Because it's like, you know, like all things, it's limited in an economic scope, where it's like, you know, if you can break down, it's great, but if it costs way, 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 way more, then like you know, it, it limits the scope of the, like the <clears throat> applicable like, uh, solutions that we can use. Yes. Um, your, your presentation is awesome, and you know you give us an understandable or almost understandable glimpse into something so complex. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is: Are there any ongoing or start beginning um, concrete efforts um, to uh, to make use of this? And do you see um, the market as um, you know jumping in to uh, to do something, you know, something yeah. concrete? Is it something that? the market could benefit by or, or just yeah, so that's a, there's a whole area called micro business. You know what I mean? So like a lot of these startups are just kind of coming around. Um, one of them actually mentioned earlier called Fungi Perfecti or my Paul Stennis. And he actually runs a business around um, you know like finding new applications for mushrooms. And uh, I think there's also another that's actually a local business, um, Smoke Town Mushrooms. Um, they work in that area. Um, but it's not limited to that. There's you know Lots of different ways in which they can find. Really, the biggest part is just finding economical um, approaches that you know essentially fix the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right now, this kind of work is still dominated very much by the DIY community. You know what I mean? Um, and actually, the the interesting thing is uh, it actually works the same way as how a fungus <laughs> applies itself to solving a problem, is that just like they have, the fungus has thousands and thousands of high feet trying out all these different combinations to see what works, right now we have thousands and thousands and thousands of DIYers <laughs> just kind of out in the community all over the world, you know, trying out new ways in which to do this. And then I'm sure like one of them, like, you know, they kind of have their own networks, you know, they're like, I've kind of been keeping my finger on the pulse of that, and like they're still working on a lot of these small scale applications. Um, but once um, we kind of try and find a way to make it a large scale application and economical, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it'll have to come from that source. Are there any, any like any Stanford's or anything doing? Oh, uh, yeah, like a lot of actually um, universities in China um, do a lot of really good work in this. Uh, it was actually a Chinese university that was able to discover the uh, back in 2014, they were the ones that have discovered. Um, the aspergillus is too regenesis capable of breaking down the plastic. Um, and they've been doing a lot of great work in that area. Um, beyond that, I think, I want to go beyond, I know, but I think um, MIT has probably been taking a look at this. Um, but yeah, again, it's all very, it's all very young. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yes. Sorry, you the um, RIT, yeah, yeah. So RIT has the school of um, like Bellasan School of Sustainable Development, and uh, I definitely have actually seen, like physically seen, um, do a lot of work like mildews and stuff like that. Um, but again, it was like, like I was, it was again still in that like small scale space. 
um, where they were working with, you know, maybe like a fish tank full of like plastic material and things of that nature. Um, another, like another really interesting like application I've seen out of this is, um, I think it was like Northwestern University, like sort of micro microfiltration program. Um, so it's the idea that like in, in order to like treat like gray water that's like running off of like you know maybe like a storm drain or something like that, you actually have water pass through a um, big bed of wood chips um, that are inoculated with oyster mushrooms, and the oyster mushrooms actually draw toxic materials out of the water. Uh, it actually draw toxic materials out of the water um, as it's passing through like the most back into the environment. So it can filter it that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Fantastic. So, like, I was just gonna like stop and like just kind of talk a little bit more about like you know mushroom biology and just kind of like the ways in which like you know, it kind of enhances the uh, kind of enhances our just un general understanding of you know ecology as such. Because um, like when we talk about ecology, like you know the first law of ecology is that everything's connected. But usually that comes off as like a kind of fluffy, like ecolala kind of statement. You know what I mean? Like what does it mean that everything is connected? Um, so fungi um, actually form a network um, between the trees. Um, so one of the biggest classes of the fungi are what are called mycorrhizal fungi. And they exist in what's called a symbiotic relationship uh, with the actual um, <laughs> with the actual tree roots. And what will happen is, is that the tree roots um, are not actually that great at drawing in um, the tree roots are actually not that great at drawing in nutrients from their environment. There's a very limited number of like things that a tree root can draw in directly. Um, so almost as long as roots have existed, there have been mycorrhizal fungi. And what mycorrhizal fungi do is they essentially coat the roots and they actually penetrate into the roots. And the, through the processes that I've described earlier where they kind of you know, release enzymes, break down the heart, and then draw in, those mycorrhizal fungi actually feed nutrients to the tree. And what happens is, is that these mycorrhizae actually form bridges. So you can imagine you can have hundreds and hundreds of trees all connected by the same mycorrhizal root structure. And uh, what they were actually able to do, I highly recommend the book on the secret lives of trees. Um, because what it talks about is that trees can actually use their mycorrhizal fungi to share nutrients. Um, so a lot of times you'll actually see tree stumps, where if you actually look at the cambium layer, the cambium layer is actually still alive, even though the tree has been totally cut down. And what's, because what's happening is that the um, mycelial network underneath the ground is still like you know saturated in all the sugars that have been gathered by the mycorrhizal fungi, and they're actually being like you know, essentially just being spread from the other living trees surrounding the stump and keeping the stump alive. And um, it's actually a way in which um, trees can actually warn each other of uh, like you know infections. It's a way that they can actually warn each other of on um, like you know like toxic pathogens in the area is that like if one tree gets infected, it actually starts releasing you know chemical signals through it actually starts releasing chemical signals through its roots into its mycorrhizae, which are then taken up by other trees, and then the other trees notice it and they start actually activating um, immune responses. Like before they've actually encountered the pathogen, they'll actually start you know creating these immune responses um, just as because the other trees were able to warn them. So mycorrhizae actually kind of, kind of provide this like physical manifestation of what ecology is about, you know, which is this connectedness of nature. Yeah. You said secret or hidden? What's that? The name of the book. Secret lives or hidden life? I think it's the hidden lives of trees. I got both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd have to look at the cover and see exactly which one. They all have trees on them, so. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, but yeah. Any other good questions? Right. Then, yeah, so I think that's pretty much all I had for today. Um, so yeah, so I just thought this like presented like a really cool opportunity 
and like you know, there's a lot of really, really great resources. Um, I would highly recommend checking out Spun Pond Mushrooms. Um, they have a great like education outreach program. I think they actually have a, uh, another um, like program similar to this one coming up soon. I can probably look that up. I have yeah. a question. As far as the state and county goes, mm -hmm. are there any programs that are doing pest management with the Not that spores aware. that go with the insects? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, there's a. Is there a push for it at all? Um, the push for it can start right here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, is, are farmers aware of it? I guess, you know, lunch. I'm almost certain not, probably. It's um, it's not something. So again, like all of this is like very new, um, in the sense that like we've been able to like you know kind of just start you know recognizing these particular like applications. Like mm -hmm. I said, like mycology has kind of been this kind of neglected mega science mm -hmm. um, going on for a long time. I'm sure I think a timeline wise, how long yeah. it's going to take for it to happen, and then when you introduce something. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be nervous at that? Yeah. No. itself is going to spread, just, you know, to cause a disruption of something else. Yeah, no, that's, that is the, um, yeah, that is actually the problem is that, like, you know, we kind of, I talked about, I tried to focus this on, like, you know, fungi as friend, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, fungi are a very, very powerful and potent biological force, and you have to be very careful around them. Mm -hmm. um, so it was actually, um, so I don't know if anyone's heard about the uh, amphibian die-off um, that occurred, you know, that kind of unfolded over the last, you know, few years, and that was actually caused by a fungi. It was caused by a fungi that could actually that actually started to eat amphibian skin, um, eventually killing them. And the reason that that was the reason that became such a problem is because the spores stuck to people. You know what I mean? The spores stuck to our people, they stuck to our, I, you know, they stuck to vehicles, they stuck to materials that we transported all over the world. You know what I mean? And like, once those spores got to the new environments, they started spreading, you know, and infecting the amphibians in that area. And that's what led to, you know, the amphibian die off. You know what I mean? So it's something, yes, that has a lot of potential for good, but also I think even adding to the fact that we need to really study mycology is the idea that like, there's also this tremendous potential for you know, harm mm -hmm. to take place. There's a lot of control there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's actually, um, that's actually a problem is that it's like, um, when I was studying Aracyphe and Cater, mm -hmm. or the white mildew, the biggest problem was that you couldn't actually, like a lot of these fungi form such strong relationships with their hosts that you can't grow them away from their host. Um, so in order to grow um, grapevine, powder and mildew, you actually have to grow it on grapes. But when you grow it on grapes, like, you're going to create a lot of spores. Yeah. You know what I mean? So in the act of actually studying the fungi as a way to control it, you create a hot spot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you actually create a hot spot for the spreading of that particular fungi. And, um, yeah, yeah, so one of, the, one of the USDA scientists I work with, that was actually a huge problem. I think he had local farmers complaining yeah. <laughs> that they were getting <laughs> they were getting the the, the uh, fungi that he was studying just simply because that was the only way he had to grow it. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. So having said that, you you do envision. I'm not saying you you have a plan ready, but you no. do envision a way of a whether it be a farm or. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know my motivation. I'm or a municipality to be able to fight pollution yeah. using this. It just has to be, it would have to be done with a mindfulness of not having it spread to what we don't want to. Exactly. Creating a horror movie that'll be on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Exactly. Like, you know, like the big, like the best way I think this could roll out is probably you have a, like, you know, indoor system set up. You know what I mean? So you're not having these enormous, like, you know, fungal, like, spore clouds yeah. pouring around where you're doing your remediation sites. And, um, and again, but there's always a cost trade off. You know, it's like if you want to do the remediation right there on site, it's a lot cheaper than having to truck, you know, the waste somewhere else to have it dealt with. Um, but like, you know, the, the safest way to do it would have like some kind of indoor temperature controlled, like climate controlled area where you kind of just bring in, you know, waste. And you just kind of keep adding it into. So not just taking a bunch of. Fungi into Plex and just dumping them on the old vacuum oil site. Is that that probably wouldn't be a smart thing? Again, like yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's just weighing risks. You know what I'm saying? Like you get something good out of that, but again, like you just got to make sure that the fungi you're working with aren't going to cause problems. Like 
generally with the oil, like they did that open because like oyster mushrooms aren't going to hurt anything. You know what I mean? It's like oyster mushrooms just create these big, happy, fluffy, like fruiting bodies that you know you can use for whatever purpose you want. You know what I'm saying? But like, but at the end of the day, I think like what we have here is like a real opportunity. You know what I mean? Because like it could be, it could very well be that the you know the problem with scalability is simply that you know, like mycology is more like conducive to small scale operations. I mean, it kind of requires that tender love and care. Um, that can only come from you know just kind of like a lot of people working together as a community um, to address. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people coming together to like you know tend to these you know kind of like little micro micro tanks. You know, kind of collecting plastic, cleaning off the plastic. You know, adding it back in. You know, kind of you know, addressing the problem that way. Um, but one thing I can't stress enough is that like this is not like a silver bullet. You know what I mean? This isn't like oh man, this is going to change everything. This is another tool in the toolkit, I would say. It's like, you know, when you talk about reduce, reuse, recycle, I think it's like, it's just adding another shell onto that. You know what I mean? It's like, if you first reduce your plastic input, your plastic output, that's the first priority. Then reuse whenever possible. Then recycle whenever possible. And when you can't recycle it, then the best option is to remediate. You know what I mean? And that's where we can bring in this kind of technology. You know what I'm saying? Right. Any questions? I was ready to start throwing mushrooms around all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, Johnny talk mushroom to, seed. Like, right. talk to someone who knows, like, <laughs> talk to like, talk to your local scientist, your local mycologist first before throwing mushrooms around. But like, I think the the, the potency of the solution is still there. Thank you. No problem. Thank you.